The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you were born between the years 1900 and 1910, here is a question which you may have asked yourself more than once. Will I be alive in 1975? Well, since 1910, the proportion of oldsters in our population has gone way up. In fact, it has increased by 68%. So the chances are getting better all the time that you will be alive in 75. And in exactly 11 minutes, we'll have a suggestion which will show you how life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society can help you make the most of this long life that's ahead of you. Tonight's FBI file, The Vicious Shakedown. There is a widespread theory about criminals that they lack intelligence and courage. Now, that theory is wrong and has been proven wrong so many times that there's no question about its being incorrect. Many criminals have IQs which show high intelligence. And if their brain power had been directed along legitimate lines, there's no telling how far their careers might have gone. But legitimate fields take effort to conquer. And if there is one truism about the average criminal... It is that he'll go to any ends to avoid honest work. The schemes he brings forth from his tortured brain are sometimes simple, sometimes involved. But always there is the same goal, getting something for nothing. Tonight's FBI file opens in a gymnasium and health club located in the business district of a large eastern city. In a small room in this establishment, a muscular rubber is giving a young man a massage. Too heavy, Mr. Hanford? No, it feels good, Tom. Up around the back of my neck a little, huh? Sure. Ah, swell. Big night last night, Mr. Hanford? Murderous. Now, take it easy around the head. Thanks. Common complaint today. Everybody's got hangovers. We all out together? Well, to tell you the truth, Tom, I don't know where I was. Huh? This is a new thing with me now. I have so many drinks and then I draw a blank. Hey, that's bad. I know, but it's all behind me, Tom. I'm on the wagon as of today. That won't do you no harm. When are you getting married, Mr. Hanford? Two weeks. Hey, that's swell. Yeah, kind of like it myself. Well, that just about does it. My time's up. Okay. Thanks, Tom. I feel fine. Now you just relax there a while, Mr. Hanford. All right. You should fall asleep. Uh, when would you like me to call you? In an hour. Take it easy. Okay, Tom. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Who's that? Hello, Mr. Hanford. Hmm? Who are you? My name is Bell. Frankie Bell. What do you want? I'd like to talk to you. What about Personal matter. Mind if I sit down? Oh, look, I'm trying to get a little sleep. That can wait. Huh? Say, what's this all about? I'm a friend of Marie's. Who's Marie? Are you kidding? Look, I'm asking you a question. I suppose you don't remember last night, either. No, I don't. And I've had enough... Hold it, mister. Last night, you and Marie got married. What? You heard me. Is this a rib or something? Think so? Take a look at it. Huh? Marriage license. Is that your signature? What? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll also find your name on the register at the Central Hotel. You and Marie spent your honeymoon there. Oh, no. No, none of this could have happened. Well, I don't know anybody named Marie. You just met her last night. It was a real quick romance. But 
Look, I'm already engaged. I'm getting married in two weeks. Mister, you're already married. I don't believe you. Okay. Suppose you check up on this marriage license. Take it. It's a photostat copy. Marie has the original. You can also check the register at the Central Hotel. Then you'll hear from me later. Some more coffee, Paul? No, thanks, Mother. Oh, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is for us to be having breakfast together. You mean novelty, don't you? <laughs> well, yes. Anyway, I'm grateful. You know something? So am I. <laughs> oh, um, Mother. Yes? Did you hear me come home night before last? Night before last? Yeah. Why, Paul, you didn't come home at all. Oh. But you stayed at the club. Oh, of course. Uh, that's right, I, I did. Mm, why do you ask? Nothing important. Oh, goodness, I almost forgot. What? This special delivery letter came for you early this morning. Here you are, dear. Thanks, Mother. I didn't know if it were important enough to wake oh, quiet, up. Quiet, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Is something wrong? No. But, darling, there Excuse must Excuse me, be... Mother. I'll, I'll see you later. Several hours later in the local FBI field office, Paul Hanford's mother is being greeted by Special Agent Jim Taylor. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Hanford? Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Now, what can I do for you? Well, this is a matter concerning my son. Yes? He doesn't know I've come here to see you, but I... I just had to. Well, what is it, Mrs. Hanford? Paul received a special delivery letter this morning. When he read it, I could see that it upset him very much. Yes, I tried to question him about it. He left the breakfast table and walked out. I see. In his excitement, he left the letter behind. I did something, Mr. Taylor, that I've never done in my life before. I, I read his letter. Well? It was sent anonymously. It demanded that he pay $50,000 to straighten out some matter. Mm. It also said that if he didn't pay, his impending marriage would be ruined and he would suffer bodily harm. Did you bring that letter with you, Mrs. Hanford? Yes, I have it right here. I see it, please. Here you are. Thank you. Has anyone else handled it other than you and your son? No. Fine. I want to have it analyzed for fingerprints. Mr. Taylor, as I told you, my son doesn't know I've come here. You did the right thing in coming. This is an extortion letter. Now, whether the basis for the threat is real or imagined, the sender has broken the law. It's our job to find him. I'd like to go over and talk to your son at once. Were you sleeping? Yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe I was. I don't know how you do it. Uh, what do you mean? Sleep at a time like this. What are you talking about? Waiting for that guy Hanford to call. I swear to you, all afternoon I've been so nervous I've broken two fingernails. Oh, Marie, just relax. Oh, I can't. It'll all come out okay. What makes you so sure? I spent two months laying this thing out. Nothing can go wrong any place along the line. And he'll think he really married me? The license is legitimate, ain't it? Yeah, but you married me with that license, not him. I work ten hours a day practicing his signature. You'll think he signed it. Same thing with the hotel register. And you honestly think he drew a blank that night? Maybe that Mickey I fed him took care of that. Well, I still can't believe he'll call. He's got a call. Look at the spot he's in. With his girl, you mean. That's right. She's a big catch for him. He can't afford to strike out there. Frankie. Hmm? Maybe he never got your letter this morning. Oh, look, will you stop putting a whammy on this? That could happen. Marie, the post office people have been around quite a long time. They're real dependable guys to do business with. Did you give my number in the letter? No, stupid. I called that health club. Left a message for him to call here. Oh. Say, I just thought of something. What now? With us being already married, and then getting married again the other night, does that make us bigger, Miss? Nope. Just me. Why? Because you've got two heads. <laughs> That's cute. Oh, gee, do you think that? Shut up. Hello? Uh, Mr. Hanford calling you, Mr. Bell. Put him on. Right. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Mr. Hanford. Are you the man that came to the health club? That's right. 
Oh, I received your letter this morning. Well? I'd like to see you. Come around here. What's your address? Garden Apartment, 82 Maple. What time? Six o'clock. Very well. See you later, Mr. Hanson. Well, honey, what'd I tell you? Go ahead, Mr. Taylor. After you, please. Very well. Oh, let me take your hat. Surely. Here. Is that you, Mother? Yes, Paul. Your son? Yes. Uh, come this way, please. Thank you. I'm here in the living room, Mother. Paul, I brought home company. Oh, really? Darling, I want you to meet Mr. Taylor. This is my son, Paul. How do you do? Hello. Paul, Mr. Taylor is a special agent of the FBI. Oh? I asked him to come here because... Well, because I read that letter you received this morning. Oh, I had to, Paul. I, I saw how it upset you. <laughs> Mother, you don't have to make a Supreme Court case out of it. There's nothing too terrible about reading a letter. Mr. Hanford, have you any idea who sent it to you? Yes, I have. Really, Paul? It was that clown, Chuck Davis. You know that boy I play squash with? But, but why should he... Mother, the whole thing was a practical joke. What? How do you know? Well, Chuck's a practical joker. I suspected him immediately. I confronted him with the letter today, and he confessed all. Oh, thank heaven. So, I'm afraid, Mr. Taylor, you're on a wild goose chase. Oh, goodness, that's so. I do apologize, Mr. Taylor. Oh, that isn't necessary. I'm delighted that it turned out the way it has. Most extortion cases haven't this happy an ending. You handle many of them, do you? Well, enough to have worked up a very strong loathing for all those who send threatening letters. How many do you catch? I don't want to sound immodest, but we bat pretty close to a thousand. I see. Well, I guess I'd better be running along. Frankie, that must be him. Could be. Who is it? Paul Hanford. Okay. Hi, Mr. Hanford. Hello. Come on in. Very well. Paul! Huh? Paul, baby! Who is she? That's Marie, your wife. Oh. Honey, don't you remember me? No. Well, that certainly isn't Marie, that... uh, Mr. Hanford came here to talk business. Let's give him a chance. Okay. Now, first, Mr. Hanford, did you check on the marriage license in the hotel? Yes. And? It could be my signature when I've been drinking. I've told you right along. We're wasting time. I will concede that I probably got drunk and married this girl. And you've apparently set a price for her calling the marriage off. Let's get right down to that. It's a pleasure to do business with you. How much? You got my letter, 50 Gs. That's out of the question. Well, what's your idea of a payoff? Well, I have it right here with me. $2,000. Two thousand? Why, you Quiet. Can't... Look, Mr. Hanford. Two thousand don't even get you inside the ground. But that's all I can raise. Don't give me that. I'm telling you the truth. Look, your mother's got scratch. Your girlfriend is loaded. Well, that has nothing to do with me. Well, and the best I can do for you is knock ten percent off for cash. The best you can do. That's right. Well, how do you figure so strongly in this? I'm an old friend of the family. Oh, well then I'd advise you to take this two thousand. Don't you do it, Frankie? Don't worry, sweetheart. I won't. Very well. You leave only one course of action open. What's that? I'm going to the FBI. What? On what ground? That was an extortion letter I received today. They'd be very happy to prosecute you for sending it. Is that a fact? Yes. Now, will you take the 2000 No. All right, then. I'm going to turn you in. You're not going to... Oh, Frankie. Yes, I'm glad you hit him. What a piker. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps provide security for your country. Now, let's talk about security for those who want to be independent as they grow older. Miss Cross, that's just a beautiful dream. By the way, taxes and living costs have gone up, I don't save a cent. So when you talk about independence when I grow older, I say, what am I going to use for money? 
Well, the plan I'd like to tell you about was designed to order for men in your financial position. Men who haven't got money to burn, but who do look forward to complete independence in their 60s. It's called the Equitable Life Assurance Society Independent 60s Plan. Sounds interesting. Let's hear more about it. The Independent 60s Plan of the Equitable Life Assurance Society has these three features. First, it costs considerably less than you probably think, especially if you're covered by Social Security. Second, you can create your retirement estate for the full amount the moment you sign the contract. You don't spend years wondering whether or not you're going to accumulate enough money to be independent in your 60s. You're sure of it because it's guaranteed by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Third, this equitable plan gives you a definite goal and a practical method of reaching that goal. Yes, there's nothing finer than being independent in your 60s, being your own boss, doing the things you want to do. Say, this is right up my alley. I think I'll look into this plan. Then get in touch with an Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. He'll give you the facts on the Independent 60s plan. Look in your phone book for the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Vicious Shakedown. People have gotten to understand almost everything in the world, except other people. It would seem on the face of it that anyone with normal intelligence would realize that you cannot do business with a criminal. Yet year after year, honest citizens continue to become involved with lawbreakers. Now there's a basic truth which every citizen should memorize. Memorize because it would save him untold agony. And that truth is that if you deal with criminals, you must get hurt. Now, tonight's file continues in Special Agent Jim Taylor's apartment. It is after midnight. He's just preparing for bed as... Hello. Hello, Mr. Taylor? Yes. Uh, this is Mrs. Hanford. Oh, yes, Mrs. Hanford. I'm terribly sorry to disturb you. That's all right. I called your office and they gave me your home number. Well, what's on your mind? I'm calling about Paul. Yes? Terribly worried about him. He left here right after you did this afternoon. He was presumably going to drop off at the health club for a minute. Then he had a dinner date with Christine, his fiancée. Yes, go on. After that, he was taking us both to a concert. He hasn't kept ever any, any of these appointments. And you haven't heard from him? Not directly, but I called our lawyer. I learned that Paul had gone to see him this afternoon right after he left the house. He asked for $2,000. Said he needed it desperately. I see did he get the money? Yes. Well, Mrs. Hanford, I'll come right over to your house. Come right into the living room, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. I, I'm very grateful to you for coming over. It's my job, Mrs. Hanford. Well, not to cater to a nervous woman's fears. Well, I'm sorry to say that it looks like your fears are justified. About the extortion note? That's right. Your son's getting that 2000 from your lawyer certainly makes it appear that he wanted it for a payoff. But he told us this afternoon that the note was a practical joke. Yes, I know. That was just to alleviate our suspicion, I imagine. Where can he be now? That's the important thing. We've no idea where he's gone. Yes, I know. Or did he mention anything to your lawyer as to where he might be going? No, he just said he was going to his club, the health club. Mm -hmm. Have you called there? Yes. What did they tell you? That he'd called in earlier in the afternoon. What for? To see if he'd gotten any messages. And had he? I, I didn't ask. That could be very important, Mrs. Hanford. Why? He could have been contacting the club because he expected a message there. Oh, I see. Will you let me have the number, please? I'll phone him at once. Frankie, he's coming too. Yeah. Should I get him some ice or something? What for? That lump on his head. Leave him alone. 
He may grow a few more before we're done. Oh, my, my head. It hurts, huh? Yeah, it feels as if... No, it's you. That's right. I'm still here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me, let me get up. Should you, Frankie? Yeah, he can sit in that chair. But look, mister, don't try anything because something new has been added since you left us. This gun. I see it. Well, you think you're ready to talk business again now? There's nothing to discuss. Oh, yes, there is. We had a board of directors meeting. We decided to cut the price. To, to 2000 No, 25000 Not interested. We decided something else in that meeting. Really? Mm-hmm. Strategy. How to make you pay the 25 Gs. That's not possible. Not even if we called the newspapers, gave them the story on your marriage to Marie? They wouldn't listen to a cheap hoodlum like you. Now you're forgetting I got proof. But that would take too much time. I got an even better way. That's to call your girlfriend, Christine. I'm not listening to any of these shakedowns. You know something, Frankie? I bet he don't think you'd have nerve enough to call her. You think I should show him? Yeah. Give me that address book. Sure. Here. Hey, that's my address book. Yeah, yeah, I know. I borrowed it when you passed out. Let's see. Uh... Yeah, yeah, here it is. Uh, the number is Main 72932. 2932. That's right. Get her on the phone. Okay. Uh, wait. Huh? Never mind. Call her, baby. Hello? Oh, there's never anybody on that switchboard. Yes? Hello, this is Mrs. Bell. I... Marie! Oh, oh. Yes, Mrs. Bell? Mrs. Bell? Do you still think you should make that call? Hang up, stupid. Frankie, Shut I up. didn't... Shut Start packing. Leaving town, folks? Yes, and you're two Gs. But before we go, I'm making sure you keep quiet. <laughs> This is the apartment right here, Mr. Taylor. We got a key. Yes, sir, but like I told you, the Bells left here five minutes ago. They had bags with them like they were going away. I'd still like to see the apartment, please. Good thing. Yeah, this should do it. Did the Bells say where they were going? No, sir. Do you know if they took a cab? But they didn't say there aren't many this hour in the morning. Here we are. Go ahead, sir. Hi. This furniture belongs to the house. They rented a the place this way. I see. Yeah, what's that? I don't know. Sounds like it's coming from behind that door. It's a closet. Someone in there. He's locked in. Yeah, I got a key that should fit that. Good. This guy in here could be the one you're looking for. Mm, Mr. Hanford. There. Hey, found a gag. Yes. Untie that gag, will you? I'll get these ropes. Sure thing. See the missing guy? Yes. There you go, mister. Oh, thank you. I'll have your legs untied in a minute, Hanford. Thanks, Mr. Taylor. Where are the bells? Gone. Where to? I was hoping you'd have the answer to that one. Yeah, that does it. Oh, swell. Oh, Hanford. Yeah? Your practical joke didn't turn out so well, did it? I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor. Whatever your problem was, you were a fool to attempt to handle it yourself. I know that now. Did you pay these people any money? They forcibly took 2000 from me. Getaway money. I imagine so. I guess I can kiss it goodbye. I don't imagine they'll be easy to find. Here's something that might help. What is it? Let me get to a phone. Frankie! Frankie, what are you doing? Putting the bags in the trunk compartment. What for? They will have them, stupid. Yeah, but if the car won't start... You only have to take them out again. The car will start as soon as we get that wire connected. When will that be? Marie, you heard the man yourself. He said he was going up to the front of the garage to get a new wire and to be right back. But he hasn't come back. Uh, Look, Frankie, my complaint is we've kept the car in this garage for over two years. We certainly deserve better service than this. Oh, shut up. Hey, hey I, I hear someone coming now. Uh -huh. Well, it's about time that you got here with that... Frankie! What is it? Come here. Huh? It's Mr. Hanford. Hello there, Frankie. How'd you get here? Mr. Taylor, I'll let you explain that. I found a bill from this garage in your apartment, Frankie. I called here just before you arrived. The attendant was kind enough to stall you until we could get here. 
Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Frank Bell and his wife, Marie, were both tried and convicted for extortion. They were sentenced to long terms in a federal penitentiary. And so the careers of two more shakedown artists were ended by your FBI, but ended only after the potential victim had placed himself in great jeopardy by attempting to deal with the criminals himself. You wouldn't ask a plumber to pull a tooth for you, nor would you ask a dentist to fix a leaky pipe. And yet you will, you do, ask yourself to perform a job of dealing with criminals when there is at your disposal every type of law enforcement agency you need. Remember this, and do your part in curbing the crime wave. When you receive any kind of threat, notify your local police or your state law enforcement officers or your FBI. Crime is their business. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Tonight, instead of the customary closing commercial... I should like to read to you a telegram I have just received from Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Mr. Parkinson has wired me, and I quote, Today in America, many life insurance men have the right to add to their signature the letters CLU. Those three letters, CLU, stand for Chartered Life Underwriter. They designate a man who has taken advanced courses in the scientific adaptation of life insurance to the needs of American policyholders. Tomorrow is the 20th anniversary of the founding of the American College of Life Underwriters, which awards those CLU degrees. Therefore, Milton, in my name, will you call the attention of our vast listening audience to the fine service performed by the American College of Life Underwriters during its first two decades and wish this distinguished institution continued success during the years ahead. Signed, Thomas I. Parkinson, President, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Hand-Packed Thief. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Henpecked Thief on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.